Good afternoon and welcome to the OR Today webinar series. OR Today is focused on giving back to the perioperative community through our monthly magazine, website, and annual OR Today Live Surgical Conference and Expo. Let's kick off today's webinar by giving an OR Today Live tote bag to the attendee that can tell us what city will host our 2017 OR Today Live Surgical Conference. Use the question feature on your webinar dashboard to answer now. While you're answering, I want to remind you we will award certificates of attendance for participation in today's webinar. To obtain your certificate, you must complete the post-webinar survey, which will appear immediately on your computer screen at the end of today's call. If you do not receive the survey, please email us at webinar at mdpublishing.com. All right, and the winner of our OR Today Live tote bag is Jana Peary. Congratulations. Our 2017 OR Today Live Surgical Conference and Expo will be held August 27th through 29th in Washington, D.C. Visit ortodaylive.com for more information. Our presenter today is Michelle Jackson, who serves as Manager of Surgery Scheduling for St. Luke's Health System anchored in Boise, Idaho. She oversees centralized surgery scheduling for more than 40 OR suites, as well as multiple procedural areas with an annual volume totaling over 50,000 cases. Michelle, you may begin whenever you are ready. Thank you so much, and thank you for that kind introduction. I appreciate it. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us today. Um, we are going to be looking at block scheduling five years later. So I want to start by giving you a little bit of information about St. Luke's. Um, so we are a not-for-profit community-owned accountable care organization founded in 1902. We have about a 50-50 split between our employed and our independent physicians and are anchored by three larger hospitals hospitals, two of those being within about 15 miles of each other, and those are the two hospitals that we'll be focusing mostly on um, during this presentation today. Um, outside of our two hospitals, we do have one other primary uh, competing hospital here in our Treasure Valley, and we serve Southwest Idaho as well as Southeast Oregon. These are all important factors when we're talking about block scheduling and scheduling policies because depending on the makeup of your facility and your area, your policies and criteria may look very different. For us, um, I believe that the three main components that we look at when creating our policy are case mix, competition, and capacity. So first being case mix. Your scheduling and block policies are going to look very different if your cases are mostly an elective nature versus if they are more of an urgent emergent nature. So for instance, a block policy in a total joint facility is going to look much different than a policy in a trauma center. Your um, ratio of open to block time is going to look very different, as well as your utilization criteria. Secondly, your competition. You're probably going to have a more stringent policy if you have less competition. Um, you try to keep those ladders kind of a little bit more stable when there's competition and your doctors can take their cases elsewhere. And then lastly, capacity. So if you are functioning at a high capacity, your utilization requirements are going to look different than if you're trying to make sure that your doors are open for any case that might come through. In our organization, our OR utilization is greater than 70% excluding turnover time. So as I'm sure you're aware, that means that we're functioning at capacity most of the time. The information that I'm going to share with you today is a compilation of research and publications as well as education, and we took all of that and mixed it with our experiences here at St. Luke's. We've learned a lot through trial and error. Um, we've watched decisions that we've made fix the problem that we intended for them to fix, but then create new problems that we didn't foresee. We've seen successes, but we've also had opportunities to revisit topics. 
overall, we've been very successful. Our utilization in our larger facilities where the policies are actively managed have maintained block utilization in the upper 90% for several years. So our policies that we put into place have proven to be sustainable as well. So our objectives for today's webinar are first to convey to you the elements of a well-written block policy. And of course, that's in our opinion and what has worked for us. Um, I hope that you can recognize the activities essential to a well-managed block system, communicate to you the benefits of using block time and the way that those contribute to an efficient OR. And lastly, we'll spend the bulk of our time really talking about lessons that we have learned from hands-on experience and education. So some of you may have um, attended previous presentations, and so I don't want to spend too much time focusing on the history, but I do want to give you just a little bit of an idea of where we kind of started on our journey of block utilization here in uh, the Treasure Valley. So in November of 2010, we formed a multidisciplinary block committee and started holding meetings. And what prompted that was we had a lot of frustrated surgeons. We had a block policy, but it really needed some work and refining. Um, and our surgeons didn't know what to do. Our administration didn't know what to do. We didn't have a good plan. And so our director at the time said, you know, let's take those frustrations and turn them into something productive. And so we started forming the block committee with those surgeons who had some very valid um, complaints and gripes about how the OR was running, combined them with anesthesia as well as OR leadership and administration to really get our hands on what the issues were and where we could improve. We evaluated goals for the modifying block time and scheduling, looked at what was working and what wasn't. Uh, we had a lot of issues with doctors trying to get cases on the board, but they'd be told, sorry, there's no time available. And then they would walk in the day of surgery and find that maybe we had empty ORs, and that was very frustrating to them. And all of that looped back to our blocks that we had that weren't being utilized that also were not being released. And so that was a big thing for us to look at that utilization as well as the release criteria. Based on some of those frustrations, we determined our why. Why were we going to embark on this journey? And what, were, what was going to be our end result? We looked at best practices from other facilities. We did lots of literature reviews, pulled um, different ideas of what was happening in other facilities, and then really evaluated those to decide what would work for our facility. We made sure all along that um, all through that process that administration and the surgeons were supportive so that we ended up with a policy that everyone could agree with. After about a year's worth of work, we finally had a new policy that we were ready to implement, and so we immediately started education. We did that through multiple mediums, uh, letters, emails, open houses, and we're very focused on including the clinic managers and schedulers as well as surgeons. Um, we know a lot of times these sorts of things are really managed by people other than the physician. Really, they just want to know where to be and when to be there. And there are a lot of other people behind the scenes that are ensuring that everything else is working properly. So we wanted to make sure that they understood what we were doing and why as well. That worked for us for about a year and a half. We um, were able to use the policy to address the low-hanging fruit. So the doctors who kind of we're just waiting to see how long it was going to take for somebody to come back to them um, and talk to them about their non-utilization of their block. We also used that time as just an education time. We were quite surprised when we started talking to the clinics. Um, we had doctors who didn't realize they might have a block on Thursday that they've never used um, and found out they don't use it because they didn't even realize they had it. Um, or maybe they thought their block only ran until three, but we had it until five, and so we 
had that two hours at the end of every day that they had no intention of using because they didn't even realize that it was theirs. So that first year and a half was really just a lot of education and conversations that were long overdue um, but made a huge impact. Once we got to the end of 2013, we felt like we had kind of dealt with everybody who was buying into the concept of re refining this policy, um, but we still had some doctors who said, okay, great, you've got a policy here, but who's going to make me give up my block time or who's going to make me um, make modifications to this block? And we went back to our block committee, and they all kind of said, hey, I, I was here to help you kind of reorganize this, and I'm happy to provide that input, but I'm not going to be the bad guy among my peers and be responsible for that. And so we formalized our committee reporting structure to where the block committee is a recommending committee who reports up to one of our medical staff committees who then um, enforce from there. And that has worked out really well for us. And that kind of brings us to where we are today, five years later, where we feel like the policy is working great, but there are things that we need to clarify and some new topics that have come up over the years. So let's get started with critical elements of a block policy. Again, these are going to vary per location and based on those three C's that we talked about earlier. But the bolded elements are really what I consider to be critical in a block policy. It's the specifics within each topic that are going to look different. And you'll need to define what works best for your facility. So what I tell you today is that these elements are important, but what they look like in your policy is up to you. So the first one is clear guidelines for allocation of block. First, blocked versus open. This is something that we missed the first time around. We had a great policy written um, that lined out the order that we were going to allocate block in. Um, I thought we had our bases covered, but what we didn't account for was how do we reserve that open time? We do um, you know, need that time for urgent and emergent cases and those doctors who may not have enough volume for block but do need some time on the board. And we didn't account for that. Um, and so we've recently, revamped, in our revamp, um, put into our policy that we are going to reserve some open time. Now, if you look at literature reviews, you'll probably see an industry standard of an 80-20 split. But I think that goes back to um, your case mix. That's going to look different in a total joint facility than it is in a trauma center. So what does that, what's the right balance for your facility? Next, you'll want to look at how will block time be allocated when it's available. You're going to just give it to the first person who requested it, whoever has the oldest request on file. Um, are you going to base it on proven case volumes? This criteria makes a lot of sense because you obviously don't want to give away block time that's not going to be used. And so you want to know that they have the volumes and can prove that. But what about your new doctors who are coming in? How are they going to prove those volumes? How will you respond to the doctor who says, my volumes would be better if I had consistent block time? Or that surgeon who promises to bring volume from another location if they had block time in your area? Um, another consideration might be citizenship, just being a good doctor, you know, keeping the good ones around and really catering to them. Um, but how will you keep this objective instead of subjective? Uh, you can't really just use the criteria, do you think the doctor's nice or does everyone like them? So it really has to look at metrics such as infection rate, on-time arrivals, and again, then this poses a problem when you have new surgeons coming into your facility. How will you get that information on these surgeons? Another alternative might be service lines. So if an ortho doctor gives up a block, does another ortho doctor automatically get it? This can be beneficial, um, especially for downstream services. So if your PT and OT are used to your orthopedic doctors working on certain days of the week, it can certainly be less disruptive for them when an ortho doctor leaves if another ortho doctor just you know, fills in in their place. Um, but what does that look like to the general surgeon who's been on the waiting list for a couple of years? So all of these are not right or wrong ways to allocate your block, but they are alternatives that have to be thought through carefully and considered. 
Next would be clear expectations and rules. What is your utilization requirement? And are you going to include used and release time? Do you want to track both of those? Before we uh, revamped our policy, we didn't track uh, released time. As long as doctors released it per the policy, that time was not counted against them in any way, shape, or form. So you can definitely see how a doctor who may never use their block could stay in good standing as long as they were maintaining their block and releasing it per policy guidelines. So we started to look at that time released as well because really our overall intent is matching the time that you need with the time that you're granted. Um, and when they're not met, when utilization requirements aren't met, then what happens? What is that process? Be very clear on this because this is a policy that you are vowing to follow. Also, clear utilization calculations. So what will be included in your utilization calculations and what won't be? Will you include turnover? If so, then your utilization expectation percentage is probably higher. Will you use the actual turnover or will you use a set amount? So for every case, we're going to automatically give you 20 minutes of turnover. When deciding this, you may think about whether turnover is a source of contention in your area or if you feel like your turnovers are pretty good. In our facilities, turnovers could improve. And so this was an area of contention and we weren't ready to really tackle that. And so we give the doctors credit for that those turnover minutes in their block utilization because at the end of the day we don't want the room staff who may have had a slower turnover held responsible for a doctor not meeting their utilization requirements. Another thing to consider is does your reporting software support one way or the other? Um, so you can really work against yourself and create a lot of work for yourself if you make a policy that your reporting software doesn't support. It can take a lot of work to get the data turned around to what you need. And then what about your first and last cases and when a doctor only has one case, do they get any set up and clean up or do they only get it if they have subsequent cases? Um, block you, or time used outside of your block, will that be credited? Do you care if your doctor works from 8 to noon, which is when their block is, or do you only care that they worked four hours in the day? So does crediting end when the block ends or does crediting end when the doctor's thesis for the day end? Um, a clear process for review of utilization. How often will your utilization be reviewed and how often can your surgeons expect to, for you to communicate with them? In our facility, um, myself as well as the managers and administration review utilization every month, but we communicate it to the physicians quarterly. And who is responsible for ensuring the accuracy of the data? Um, I can tell you that I've had many, many hard conversations with doctors about their block utilization. And fortunately, I can't even think of one at the moment where my data was wrong. But I can tell you that it was scrutinized. And had they found an error in that data, our entire platform would have been over. So making sure that you have a person who is responsible for ensuring the accuracy of data before taking it to the surgeons is incredibly important. And then who's, gonna, who's your audience? Who's going to review that data? Who needs to see it? And who will it be helpful for? A clear enforcement plan. What is your process for communicating with the surgeon? Are you going to send them their data via email, um, a letter? Is it going to go to their office? Is it just going to go to them? Do you just post it in your surgeon's lounge and they're expected to review it if they want to see that data? What will that look like and what are you committing to? Who is the ultimate enforcing body? So as I mentioned earlier, we kind of neglected to address that in our first round of our policy um, and have seen great success once we outlined that and got that to the right group. And then is there an appeals process? So when a doctor has gone through this enforcement policy and they're not meeting criteria and the block committee or whomever is managing this makes a recommendation to remove that block, is that an end-all be-all or do, is there an appeals process? Is there another group that your doctor can go to to appeal that decision? 
So now let's move into activities essential to a well-managed block system. Um, first, support from your executive leadership. Block is very near and dear to a surgeon's heart, and so any modifications that you're going to make to block time um, are probably going to be fairly contentious. So you want to make sure that you have the support that you need from your executive leadership, because that's probably where your doctors are going to be headed if they don't like a decision. They also need to be aware of what the um, factors are contributing to block utilization and also OR utilization as a whole, and they need to have an understanding of how all of that works together. Um, Communicate clear expectations when block is granted. We spend a lot of time managing block and trying to take block away in the end. Um, but if we invest that time up front, realize that block is a privilege, not a right, and communicate that to the surgeons, it goes a long ways. Again, that accurate and concise data collection and reporting, consistent communication, consistent application of policy rules, so following your own policy. Um, and that kind of ties into my last bullet point of legal consideration, applying the rules fairly. Make sure that you are applying your policy to all surgeons fairly, or it leaves you open to some pretty negative impacts. Um, we spend a lot of time with our legal team ensuring that what we're doing is following um, what the legal team would want us to do, and that has been their message back to us each time. Don't care what your policy is, make sure that you have a policy, make sure you follow your policy, and make sure you are applying it fairly across the board. That becomes really sticky as well if you're in a facility like ours where we have a mix of employed and independent physicians. That can play into a lot of arguments, and you need to make sure that that is not a valid argument when it comes to your enforcement of your block policy. And the last one there that I had skipped over is just strategic and creative thinking. So thinking outside the box, I think that block time um, is not going to work for everybody. There are going to be subspecialties that just don't work in a block setting. And so trying to find alternatives for them, making sure that your block time is not your only way for your surgeons to access um, to have access to your ORs. So thinking outside the box and trying to um, create time for those other specialties is incredibly important. So the benefits of utilizing block time I think are pretty well known, so I won't spend much time covering this. Um, but of course, it will lead to more efficient use of your OR time. If you have the same types of cases in a room throughout the day, the same doctor, you have the same equipment, the same room set up and the same staff that can very, more efficiently um, complete those cases in a timely manner. You have consistent and fairly predictable volumes, so you know, you have a pretty good idea of what your volumes are going to be each day of the week based on your block utilization and the doctors that have block on those days, and therefore you can plan accordingly. You may even be providing an incentive for increased volumes from surgeons who are striving to meet their utilization goals. So if a doctor is not meeting these utilization goals, they may consider bringing volumes from either another hospital or maybe other days of the week where they're just plugging their cases into the OR schedule and really get consistent in using their uh, utilize, or, sorry, block time. And then lastly, better resource allocation. So again, you can predict where your resources are needed. You can align your staffing model with your blocks and make sure that you have those resources available to meet the needs of your block surgeons. So now I'd like to jump into some of the lessons learned as we've gone through this journey in the last five years. And starting with the surgeon-led block committee. This is definitely something that um, some people have found success with and others have not. Luckily for us, it has been incredibly successful. Um, the surgeons, many of the surgeons who started this process with us five years ago, six years ago, are still involved today and still being able to really contribute some great information and feedback to the committee. It definitely allowed for um, 
quicker and easier physician buy-in to the new policy. It definitely became something that we did with the surgeons rather than to them. And they were able to communicate to their peers that this truly was an attempt to address their concerns, not to make anything harder or tighten down the clamps for the surgeons. It allowed them to have a voice and be part of the solution rather than just voicing their issues and concerns each time that they had one. They also began to understand the complexity of it. Um, it wasn't quite as easy as they thought it should be. And so it was very helpful for them to be involved in that. And it adds a well-rounded perspective when considering policy changes and ways to address common issues. We were, we've been amazed multiple times as surgeons from different specialties come and really talk about the intricacies of their specialty and why something that works for one specialty doesn't work for another, or why maybe our pediatric surgeons do need those earlier starts in the day, and our um, surgeons who primarily operate on adults have considered taking later start times to allow those kiddos to be first thing in the morning. So it's really allowed that collaboration between the surgeons, and it's allowed our administrative team to not have to be in the middle of all of those. Those doctors have been able to work some of that out on their own. It doesn't come with, without some risks, um, and one of those is that you are bringing your medical staff into your operations, and that's a very fine line. It's very tricky to determine when the surgeon should be part of those conversations and when not. At the end of the day, your operations, your administration is responsible for the efficient running of your ORs, and so trying to find that balance of bringing the perspective of the surgeons but also holding the final say in your operations is important. Also, we've probably all worked with surgeons long enough to know that they're not always looking out for the best interests of the greater community, um, but individual priorities instead. And that's kind of a caution as well as an advantage. Uh, it's definitely helpful when you have a surgeon like that and they can come to the block committee and defend themselves in front of their peers and kind of tell each other why they think they're more important or why they think they're more unique than the other. And it um, changes the dynamic of the conversation quite quickly. But those surgeons can also be the ones who will dominate the meeting and lead to sometimes a very unproductive meeting. So I think that can work for and against you when you choose, if you choose to use a surgeon-led block committee. Our committee is all voluntary. Um, there is no commitment to it. And we have had doctors who come and go. Some come when they have a vested interest. Maybe they're on the waiting list for block time, and they want to put that additional plug in for themselves. And others are just interested in the overall efficiency of the OR. They find it intriguing, and they want to be a part of it. So we allow any physician who has an interest to attend our block committee meetings which also necessitated our reporting structure being that it went back to our surgical supervisory committee instead of the block committee. So I think that there's a couple ways that you could approach that. But for us, we wanted to make sure that nobody was required to be there. We wanted them to want to be there and want to be um, give input and be a part of that solution. Um, next is lessons learned on our policy. So I think policies tend to obviously be very black and white and specific. And you want to make sure that it's specific enough to be enforceable and equally applied. However, you do need to leave yourself room to function. So an example of that might be in our facility, we require 75% utilization with less than 25% of your available time released. So what do you do then if you have a doctor who has 95% utilization, so they're well above that criteria, but they released 26% of their time. So our policy says if they fall out on either of those criteria, they're not in good standing. However, that doctor, obviously, if you looked at the numbers, is in very good standing. They actually probably did more than we asked them to in that they 
released more, they released time that they didn't think they were going to use, and then they probably used it. And so we had to go in and make a modification to our policy because if we followed our policy, we were going to be penalizing our doctors who um, had really put in that extra effort to ensure that they had released their time. But yet in the end, they were using more time than we really had required them to. Um, balancing policy guidelines with real life. Is there room for leniency or is it by the book? This is really important when you're implementing your policy. Is, are you going to enforce it down to the letter of the law on day one or are you going to allow for an implementation period? Also remember that not every situation fits into the box. So have a support group that you can go to to assist you in decisions that aren't addressed by the policy. You certainly will find instances, just like you do in every other situation um, that we deal with day in and day out, where the policy just doesn't answer what you should do in that situation. So whether you have a block committee or you have an administration committee or whatever you have, make sure that you can summon that group to help you in those situations situations and then make sure that that group remains consistent so that you can ensure that you are treating everyone fairly. And then your policy should be reviewed frequently to ensure that it's working the way it is written. Um, you may need to modify it once you've applied it and kind of figure out what's working for you and what's not. In granting block time, as I mentioned earlier, clarifying those expectations at the time that block is granted is so crucial. You might even consider a signed contract when block time is granted. Make sure that you've communicated that block is a privilege, it's not a right, and it can be taken away. Clarify block details such as the day, the start and end time, release requirements, utilization requirements, all of those important um, expectations. And then make sure that your surgeons receive a copy of the policy to clarify those. They are likely not going to be going out and hunting for your block policy. And so you need to make sure that you have provided that information for them up front to ensure that you've really set that expectation. Once block is given, it can be very difficult to take away. So investing the time and research up front to save yourself the trouble on the back end is definitely a lesson that we've learned time and time again. Um, one example that I can give you of that is we had a neurosurgeon who had block time in one of our facilities and was not meeting utilization expectations of that time. And so he knew he was about ready to lose his block and he didn't want to lose it even though he wasn't using it. And so he went to our other facilities director and told her that he had all this case volume, that he just wasn't able to get on at our other facility and if he could get some consistent block time, he would be happy to bring those cases to the facility. And so without even thinking to check and see if his story was true, um, that OR manager gave him a 7.30 Monday morning block time every week. And it didn't take long to figure out that she had a room empty every Monday morning at 7.30. But she had already given the block time and our policy does definitely um, favor the surgeons, and so it's about a six to nine month process to make any block modifications. And so she had a nine month process of watching her room on Monday mornings at 7.30 set empty. So again, invest the time and the research up front to save yourself the trouble on the back end. Uh, open time versus block time. So as I mentioned to you earlier, we failed at this in our first go round on our policy. We did not leave ourselves open time. So even if block is consistently being utilized, too much block time in your ORs can really limit your availability for your non-block doctors and cases. And that leads to other problems. Block time is a great recruiting tool, but it can be a frustration for new surgeons who do not have block and need to schedule cases in open time. 
Um, this topic kind of brings me back also to ensuring that you have support from your executive leadership. We had a time where each new doctor who came into our ORs said, well, when they were recruiting me, they promised me some block time, and we said, well, who is they? And we're immediately having some conversations with our recruiters and our administration to remind them that while we would love to accommodate these new surgeons coming in, we have a waiting list of eight to ten doctors deep who have been here and been faithful to our organization for a long time. And so that may be an incentive to get the new doctor that you're really wanting to get into our facility. However, when you do that, you are also irritating some um, other very important doctors. And so definitely want to make sure that you use that appropriately as a recruiting tool when it's available. You also have to think about your urgent and emergent specialties like general and ortho who can face frustration when they're trying to schedule their cases in the shorter turnaround that they typically have. So block time works really great for your total joint doctors and your doctors um, who can maybe predict their schedules further out. But it may not be the right fit for your more urgent emergent type doctors. If a general surgeon has block time every Wednesday, but they see a patient on Thursday who needs surgery in the next two to three days, that Wednesday block isn't really helping them. So we have to get outside of thinking that block time is the solution to every issue and really, again, think outside the box of how do we accommodate those types of surgeons um, and make sure that we have the time available for them and those unpredictable volumes because those are there and they are needed. Realize that not every service line benefits from block scheduling. So again, that typically addresses the needs of elective practices, but not your urgent emergent specialties. We deal with that a lot, especially with our pediatric general surgeons. And they actually are in a little bit of a tricky situation because they have an elective practice as well as being our pediatric surgicalists. And so they try to balance using their block time for elective cases, but using designated urgent emergent time for their more acute or urgent and emergent cases. Communication, again, one of the biggest things that I would stress is just that communication. One-on-one -on -one conversations seem to work best with surgeons who just don't get it. Another example that I can give you, we had a doctor who joined the block committee after he received a letter stating that his utilization was not meeting expectations. And of course, that just infuriated him. And so he joined the committee, and he was going to revamp all of the policies because they just weren't fair. And he was here at the hospital from sunup to sundown. He was the first person in the OR and the last person to leave. And how could we be telling him that he is not using his time? And so after a couple of meetings, it became obvious that it was going to take more than just the communication within the meeting. And so we set up a one-on-one -on -one appointment and sat down with all the numbers. And he came in, guns blazing, this just can't be right, your numbers are wrong. And he had a list of all of his cases and the time that he went into the OR at the beginning of the day and the time that he came out of the OR at the end of the day. And through that conversation, what we found was he was absolutely correct. He was spending a lot of time in the hospital. He also had a passion for his patients. And so he would operate on his first patient, and then he'd follow that patient to recovery. And he would stay with that patient for a while to make sure they were stable and everything was going good. Well, then he would go over to pre-op, and he would start seeing his next patient. So he was creating huge gaps in his surgical day. He would go as far as to even head up to the floor with his patients and be gone for an hour, hour and a half in the middle of his surgical day because he wanted to follow his patients up, ensure that they had all the orders, that his patients got settled on the floor. All great and noble things. And yes, it added to the time that he spent in the hospital every day. But when it got down to it, he was spending more time doing those things than he was spending in the operating room. And so through that one-on-one -on -one conversation, looking at his data and looking at mine and showing him that my data really did match everything that he was 
arguing that he did, um, he was able to see where those inefficiencies were and was able to rearrange the way that he visited his patients so that we could keep the ORs running. He understood that he had a time limit. If he wanted to go to the floor to see a patient, he would run up there really quick and come back before his next patient was ready for him. And it was really a success story. Through that communication, he was able to change his view of the block policy. He was able to understand the importance of utilizing that OR time when we have it reserved for him. Um, and he was able to figure out a way actually to more efficiently work his day so that his hours at the hospital actually reduced. Um, what surgeons care about most is really ensuring that they can schedule their cases when they need to. So finding ways to balance their needs with OR availability is a win-win. That goes back to those conversations with surgeons. And they are so scared to give up any of their block time. And when I have that conversation with them to say, hey, you're only using 50% of this time that we give you, they say, well, I know, but if I give up that time, I'm not going to be able to get my cases on the board. Because when I tried to book a case on last Wednesday, they told me that I couldn't get my case on. And I say, well, OK, there was probably a doctor on Wednesday who had block time that they weren't going to use, but they didn't want to give it up just in case. Does that sound familiar to you? Well, yeah. So, so if we're in the mentality that we're always going to hold on to time, even if we don't think we're going to need it, and everybody does the same thing, this is where you run into your frustration, where you walk into the OR, and there may not be cases on the board, but you had been told that you are not going to be able to book into that time. And so getting them to see that they're really their own worst enemy when they do that can be a big win. So trying to show them how they can work to make sure that they're able to accommodate other surgeons and other surgeons are able to accommodate them can help them as well as, of course, increase your OR utilization. Trials can be a super successful way to get surgeons to buy into modifications. So if you have a doctor that you need to make some modifications to their block time and they're very resistant, um, then offering a trial is a really great alternative. Hey, let's try this for the next two to three months and see how it feels. And if it doesn't feel OK, we'll come back to the drawing board. We'll figure out another solution. Um, but we'll try this before we make any permanent changes. And we have used this over and over again. And I can think of very few times that we haven't, in the end, made the modification. Because, of course, I'm not going to suggest a modification that I don't think will work for them. So I make sure that, based on their history, this is what we need to do, um, and convince them of that by just trying it for a couple of days and promising them that we'll come, or a couple months, promising them that we'll come back to the drawing table if it isn't working and they're finding frustration in this process. Um, including OR staff and education. Again, as we talked about before, that staff is so important and they play such an important role in block and scheduling. And so making sure that they're aware of what, when policies change, um, what the doctor's block utilization is, and what they can do to better help their doctor is all important. And lastly, just communication over and over and over again. Um, I have doctors now who just come and find me and say, hey, anything you want to talk to me about with my block? Um, they're just, once they get it, most of them become very passionate about knowing that and making sure that they're not doing anything to jeopardize their block. And a couple more things. Um, again, use best practices and other facilities as a starting point, but explore which elements will and won't work in your facility. Again, not everybody fits into that box. And so use those to garner ideas, but know that that may not work in your facility, or you may find a, an alternative version of that same concept that will work for you. 
develop a system-wide approach if your doctors are privileged at more than one facility. This allows for consistent expectations for surgeons, regardless of what location they are in, and also prevents that ask mom if dad says no type of scenario. So the one that I gave you earlier where the doctor went from one of our facilities to the other for block time because they were losing it at the first one um, is prevented when we have system-wide policies. And lastly, everything can and will be tied back to block utilization when doctors are held accountable to it. So be prepared for that. They will um, talk about turnover times and about meetings that the hospital requires them to be in and all of those. And some of those are very viable um, excuses or reasons for them to have had lower block time block utilization, and some aren't. So you'll need a system to really vet that out and determine when it's a valid um, reason that you need to look at and when it's just an excuse that we need to move on from. So with that, I would just close with telling you that whether you're starting to create a block policy or it's time to review your policy or maybe you have a really successful policy in place. I hope that you've heard something today that helps you in some way. I hope you can take this information and consider how to use it in your facility. And I would love to share our policies with you as well as welcome you to contact me if you have any questions or need any assistance. So my contact information is listed there and I would love to hear from you. Or if you have any policies that are working really well for you, um, I would love to hear from you on those as well. Hi Michelle, this is Jamie. First, thank you for a great presentation. Uh, while you were speaking, we have quite a few questions from the attendees that came in. More than one attendee was asking if you'd be willing to share your block policies. It sounds like that's something they could email you after the webinar today to get additional information. Is that fair? Absolutely. Great. Well, attendees, you'll see on the screen now Michelle's contact information, phone number, and email shared there with you. So if if you were one of the attendees asking for additional information on the block policies, please feel welcome to give her a call. Uh, but Michelle, we'll jump into some of these other questions. The first one, what is one thing you feel you did right when you started on this journey? Hmm. You know, I think our biggest, the reason that we were able to really make this a win was bringing the surgeons into it um, and always making it something that we were doing with them and for them rather than to them. So I think that their level of involvement could be different in different facilities, but I think having that perspective and really keeping them involved in these decisions is a win. Is there one thing you know now that you wish you would have known five years ago? You know, I guess I would kind of counter what I just said um, and say that I think that that level of engagement from the physicians is incredibly important. We really have a culture of catering to our physicians. And for that reason, our policy, although the general terms of the policy stay pretty black and white and um, clear, we get into a lot of weeds of, okay, so the hospital asked me to attend this meeting, so that shouldn't count against me, or my patient got sick, and so that shouldn't count into my utilization. And so we end up creating these little caveats to policies, okay, we won't count this if this, and we won't count that if that. And so I guess what I would say is just to try to keep your policy as general as possible in those regards, and keep yourself out of the weeds of all of the exceptions that could come into play. That, that was great information, Michelle, and I think it ties into a question that came in from another attendee that I, I'm going to jump ahead of our list here. This attendee asked, what is the role of block releases to your block scheduling policy? Are they given credit for release time if they're on vacation, education, or just not available? 
Yeah, great question. So um, that is one of the block releases is one thing that we just recently modified in our 2017 uh, modifications. And what we found, what, well, let me back up. So our policy, as we created it five years ago, stated that if you release your time um, prior to your automatic release, and our automatic releases are based on service line and range from anywhere from three days to two weeks. So we said if you release it before your automatic release, that time is deducted from your available time when we look at utilization. And so that is the bucket of time that we put into that 25% allowed release. So if you do that before the automatic, it goes out of utilization and goes into that 25% that you're allowed to release. What we found, um, and again, that worked really great, but it created another problem. And that was that if I'm a surgeon and I know that I'm going on vacation three months from now, I have my airline booked and everything, I have no incentive to tell you prior to my automatic release. So my maybe I have a week release. There's no benefit to me to tell you today versus one week before I go. And so we found that we had a lot of surgeons who knew that they weren't going to be operating on a particular day, but they weren't incentivized to release that time. And so we just recently wrote into our policy that if they release it more than four weeks in advance, it's kind of like it never happened. It doesn't go into that 25% bucket, and it doesn't come out of their utilization. All right, another question. How often does your block committee meet, and what is the typical agenda? So the block committee meets quarterly, and again, that will include surgeons, anesthesia, and administrative staff. Uh, we usually start the meeting by just reviewing the overall statistics in the OR for block utilization. So what is our average utilization? What is our average amount of time released? And then we get into, of, those, of that uh, data, who is not meeting our utilization requirements. And so we look through the list of doctors not meeting those requirements and evaluate those to go into what we call our observation period. So that is a three-month period that blocks that are not meeting utilization go into this observation time. And we will update them throughout that three months, what their utilization is looking at, and really let them know that at the end of those three months, if they're not meeting utilization criteria, they may lose their block. So we look at that. We also look at the blocks that maybe were previously on observation. So in the previous meeting, we identified this group of blocks that we put on observation. And then we look at how are they doing? Have they improved? Are there decisions that we need to make about modifying or eliminating their block? And then we use the rest of the time to just talk about general OR policies. It's just a great collaborative time between the administration and surgeons that they can each bring issues that they're seeing and get the perspective of the other group. Michelle, thank you again for such a great webinar. And one lucky attendee today will win a Visa gift card for completing the post-webinar survey, which is going to appear very shortly on your screen. Again, attendees, if you do not see the survey, please email us at webinar at mdpublishing.com. You must complete the survey to obtain the certificate for the CEU credit. Uh, also, I want to invite everyone to see the upcoming webinars. There's one a month. You can see a complete calendar at ortoday.com. Please enjoy the rest of your afternoon, and we'll see you next month.